I invite you, if you would, to turn your attention now to Psalm 119. Is the passage from which our scripture reading was delivered. And I'd like to consider the content that is before us. Primarily, we'll look at verses 97 uh, through 104 of Psalm 119. And, and we will consider this content with the heading, I love my Bible. Um, and I hope you love your Bible. Um, I hope we have a hunger and thirst for righteousness and the, uh, the satiating effect of that hunger and thirst is divine and it is only fulfilled in the Word of God. Um, and somebody says, Pastor Johnson, how did we go from a sermon series, a four-part sermon series in Isaiah 40, uh, verse 31, to now all of a sudden... Psalm 119. Well, if you're asking that question, that is a good question. And let me answer it this way. Um, that maybe I should have considered a five-part sermon series from Isaiah 40. Because really, to boil down the essence of renewed strength, which is the focus of Isaiah 40, 31, you have to contrast... Isaiah 40, 30, the idea of frailty, even the youths are weak, you understand? And Isaiah 40, verse number 7, 6 and 7 there, the people are as grass. So, so in order to have the renewed strength where you mount up with wings as eagles and run and not be weary and walk and not faint, you recognize your own weakness, your own frailty, and then the chapter tells you, Isaiah communicates to you something that is not frail, something that is not finite, but instead something that is everlasting. And what is that thing that the chapter communicates? It is the Word of God. That's Isaiah 40, verse number 8. Uh, that uh, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof it falleth away, but the Word of our God it shall stand forever. The essence of renewed strength is is a love for the Bible. It is an application of the Bible. It is a recognition that the people are the grass. You know, the grass withereth. We are the weak people. The people is grass. It, it, that's, the, that's the way it's phrased in Isaiah 40. And so we then, as individuals who recognize our own weakness, and, and, and you know, the, the flower fades. We recognize the the beauty in God's creation represented through humanity, but that beauty also is a temporal beauty, at least on an earthly human level. And the beauty, though, of the Word of God, it is an eternal beauty. The Word of our Lord, it is settled in heaven. It is settled forever. It is a sure word. It is a pure word. It is really the essence of enjoying renewed strength. And I don't know how long ago uh, prayerfully, the Ainsworths picked hymn number 595 to start out our service. I don't know if that was just yesterday and you changed something, but uh, they had no idea that the pastor was going to preach on Psalm 119 this morning, and yet we opened the service with a hymn based on Psalm 119. I thought that was marvelous. I thought that was a divine appointment. Or Jeremy Neisler told the Ainsworths. I wasn't sure which one it was. And, uh, and since Jeremy typically knows ahead of time, I wasn't sure. But, uh, but uh, having heard from them just now, we understand. The Lord directed that song service and, and directed uh, this text. And so I just want to, in the moments that we have before us, just highlight the importance of the Word of God. I would suggest that the distinguishing feature of vibrant Christianity, a.k.a. renewed strength, that the distinguishing feature of vibrant Christianity is a loving understanding and a commitment to God's Word. Notice, please, Psalm 119, verse number 97. Oh, how love I thy law. It is not just your pastor who stands here and says, I love my Bible. But the psalmist is the one saying, Oh, how love I thy law. He loves the law of God. And, and see the synonyms in the text, uh, uh, the synonymous ideas of, of the, the, the Scripture or the law of God. Synonyms include, in verse 98, the commandments. 
Uh, verse number 99, the testimonies. Verse number 100, the precepts. These are all uh, ways to restate the, the, the general idea of, of, of God's Word. And so the psalmist is saying that he loves the law, and he is further saying that it is the meditation of his heart all the day long. He loves it. And again, a distinguishing feature of vibrant Christianity is, is people that love the Word and they understand the Word and they're endeavored to be committed to the Word of God. The psalmist says, I love to meditate essentially on the Bible. Um, famously, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8 tells us to think on these things. And you go through that list in Philippians 4, 8, uh, think on things that are honest and just and lovely and, and true and of good report. And I didn't say them in the, the, the right order, but you understand all of those things are true of the 1,189 chapters of the completed canon of the Word of God. The Bible is true and it is pure and it is that which we should be thinking upon. The psalmist is saying at the end of Psalm, 90, uh, Psalm 119, verse 97, that it is that which he thinks on. He loves to meditate on the Bible. He loves the law of God. He, he, and, okay, and then notice this. I appreciate how it ends, that first phrase in verse number 97 ends with an exclamation mark. Oh, how love I thy law. And then notice it, this exclamation idea in verse number 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, and an exclamation mark. And another, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth, and an exclamation mark. The emphasis here is certainly noteworthy. It's not just, I love the Bible. But there is uh, an emphatic nature to loving the Word of God, and loving specifically the law of God. Those of you that have been married for a while, you tell your spouse that you love your spouse. Often you tell your spouse you love your spouse right before you hang up the phone. And you have done that, maybe you've been married for 20 or 30 or 40 years, and you've done that lots and lots and lots over the time you've been married. And, uh, and so it's very routine. And the, maybe the thought behind it is, if something were to happen to my spouse uh, after that phone call, I want to make sure I said I love you to that spouse. However, the routine of... Uh, I talked to Britton, and, and Britton and I have discussed whatever the phone call uh, predicated, and then we at the end say, okay, I love you. She says, I love you too. Okay, bye, bye. You know, we hang up. It's very routine, but there are other times in married life when the I love you is not just routine, but maybe it is on the heels of the birth of your child, and you're emotional, and it's like, wow, look what God did. And then you hug your spouse and say, I love you. And they say, I love you too. Um, just moments, you know, on a, on a date that is just exhilarating and fun and romantic and the conclusion of it. Uh, by the way, even if you've been married a long time, I hope you still go on dates. It's a healthy thing to do. It got really quiet in here. Maybe you guys aren't, <laughs> you guys aren't dating people. I don't know, but, uh, but you should. And, and, and there are, maybe somebody wrote a letter, a poem, to their spouse, and, and it just was moving, and it was emotional, and you say, wow, thank you, it was thoughtful of you to do that, I love you, and it's, it's fine to say I love you at the end of the phone call, or I love you in the routine ways that we do, but then there are some notable times where you say, I love you, and it is emphatic, that's what's happening here, it's not just a cliche, I love the Bible, no, it is, oh, how love I thy law. That oh there gives us an emphasis. And that exclamation mark gives us the emphasis. And he says, oh, how love I thy law. And he says, I love to meditate on the Bible. I love to think about thy law. And then I, I pointed out verse number 103 because you could sum up the idea in verse number 103 by saying that he loves the Bible more than his favorite food. In other words, it causes him to salivate. That's what the Bible does. Oh, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Um, another interesting verse in Psalm 119 is verse number 72. Notice this. The law of thy mouth, referring to the word of God, the Bible as we understand it, 
is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. So to summarize 103, he's saying, I love the Bible more than I love my favorite food. And to summarize, 10, uh, to summarize verse 72, he's saying, I love the Bible more than I love my bank balance, more than I love my retirement account. You think about what your favorite food is. You ask Mrs. Johnson about her favorite restaurant. It is the Mexican restaurant over there by the airport. We enjoy, I enjoy that Texas burrito, okay, because it's got the three meats and the cooked vegetables, and I'm just saying that uh, it, I don't know of any other place that serves it just like they do. It's, it's one of my favorite. You think about what your favorite food is, and then think about your Bible, and think, could I trade my favorite food for the Word of God? That's what the psalmist is saying. Uh, do you love the Bible more than your gold and silver? If you had to pick between the Word of God and your, your retirement account, which one are you picking? It's incredible the, the, the way that the psalmist here is articulating his love for the Bible. And this is not the only time that you find in the 150 Psalms an emphasis on a love for the law of, of God. The, psalm, the, the, the psaltery itself uh, that which is the early church's hymnity. These are songs. It starts out with Psalm 1. A lot of you can quote Psalm 1, the first six verses there. Think about those, those, those verses. It, the idea there is that the blessed man, that's verse 1 of Psalm 1, and then verse 2, he delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Just like Psalm 119.97, the blessed man's delight is to meditate. In other words, he loves meditating on the Bible. And the contrast is given. Contrasting ideologies really is what the first psalm is all about. You know, those that will uh, do that which is carnal. You know, stand and, and sit and walk. You know, sit in the seat of the scornful. And walking in the way of the wicked. And these ideas. As opposed to the man who delights in the law of the Lord, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. It is a love for the Bible. And really, as you go through the 150 Psalms, there are primarily three, just three, primarily, Psalms that are dedicated to emphasizing the Bible or the Word of God, the law of God. It is Psalm 1. Very good. It is Psalm 19. And then it is Psalm 119. Um, Psalm 19, and I invite you to turn over there and look, uh, look at something with me here if you would. Psalm 19, verse number 7. The psalmist here gives us an emphasis again on the law of the Lord. Psalm 19, verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Verse number 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So to summarize uh, these verses, verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 19, uh, the law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is sure. The law of the Lord is right. The law of the Lord is a cause for rejoicing. The law of the Lord is pure. And the law of the Lord enlightens the eyes. The psalmist understands this. And again, Psalm 1 emphasizes the idea that the blessed man's delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, I mentioned the synonyms. You know, the law of the Lord synonymous with Scripture, essentially, synonymous with uh, the statutes and the testimonies and the commandments. Um, all of that is important for us to consider, but, but to go back to Psalm 119, verse number 97, I, I want to emphasize the idea of the law. Oh, how I love thy law. And some people will kind of parse these out. I'm telling you that they're generally they're synonyms. Uh, back to, to Psalm 119, verse 97, that the law and commandments and testimonies and precepts are all generally synonyms, but there are books you can buy in Christian bookstores where they will uh, kind of showcase uh, the differences in these words. But in general, they are emphasizing the same thing. But let me just point out, and can we dwell for just the next few minutes on the idea of the law? 
because I have spent so far this first portion of my sermon telling you why, why I love the Bible, why we love the law. And yet, not everybody loves the law. Um, people substitute the law of God for the judgments of their own heart. Even Christian people do that. Um, there are individuals that I've known in my 20 plus years of ministry that have validated things that are clearly not according to the word of God, but they have validated these things based on the, the notions of their own heart and based on what they call Christian freedom. And what we are finding is an overemphasis on, on, on freedom and an under emphasis on the law of God. Um, one individual said this, Jim Packer, writing a, a book about the Puritans, he said this, he said, the root cause of our moral flabbiness is that we neglected God's law. I think that's an interesting picture, moral flabbiness, and the rejection of God's law. Is it any wonder that over the last 60 plus years in the United States of America, our country has gotten away from the Ten Commandments and gotten away from prayer in public schools and gotten away from uh, morals as we understand them with Roe v. Wade in 1973 and uh, 2015, June, the legalizing same-sex you know, marriage. I mean, you just can kind of go through the Stone versus Graham court decision and I mentioned Roe v. Wade and, and so many others. And, and, and how did that happen? Well... Part of it is the church. We have kind of turned our back on loving the law of God. Um, what we're finding is that people view the law as just suggestions. Um, even Christian people, kind of just optional. And we emphasize God's grace, and we should, and we emphasize God's forgiveness, and certainly we should. But what sometimes happens is we uh, appreciate so much the grace and forgiveness of God that we then presume upon it and then go and do things that are completely antithetical to thus saith the Lord. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Um, we live in an the idea, the, the theological term is antinomianism. Um, it is the idea of anti-law, an antinomian kind of a world, a world that essentially rejects the law of God, a world that says, and even a Christian culture that says, don't tell me anything about do's and don'ts. Um, don't emphasize the Ten Commandments. Uh, and, and, and again, it's, it, it is the church as well as uh, the, call, the carnal culture all around us. And overemphasis on freedom, which then uh, sometimes promotes kind of a rebellion to the law of God, even in our hearts. I mentioned that laws have become sometimes suggestions. Have you ever thought that when you're driving in Pensacola? <laughs> that laws are just suggestions? The worst traffic I have ever seen in my life was not Pensacola, although it almost killed me, Pensacola traffic, some of you may remember. But, uh, but no, Pensacola traffic is great compared to the Dominican Republic, uh, if you've ever been out there. And there are like traffic signs, okay, in the Dominican, but it's optional, okay? And nobody is enforcing any of that. And, uh, and that's kind of how we, we treat the Ten Commandments. That's kind of how the, the, the Christian culture uh, is in relationship to thus saith the Lord. Um, also in Psalm 119, this contrast between law and liberty or law and freedom is mentioned in Psalm 119. Look at verse number 44. Verse number 44, the psalmist here of Psalm 119 says, So shall I keep thy law continually, forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty. It's the idea of freedom. Um, you might think it means lawlessness, but it does not mean that. Uh, I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I've illustrated this before this way. It may be redundant to some, but I hope it will be helpful to all. And, and what the psalmist here is talking about is how do you have freedom while you also have law? Well, what it is is it's freedom within the fence you might say, of God's protection. Uh, raising our boys, I remember at our house in Newcastle, Indiana, 
uh, the Lord allowed us to have an acre of property. And those boys could run around that acre of property and they could enjoy that property. And there is a lot of safety under the watchful eye of their parents. But there is a lot of danger on the road just outside that property. We lived on State Road 38 in Newcastle, Indiana. State Road uh, in Indiana typically are higher speed roads. And 55 miles an hour uh, was the limit. And lots of people were doing 70 plus miles an hour. And these little toddlers, uh, our boys are very close in age, uh, and so uh, go run and go play and go throw the football and go kick a soccer ball and go do all of these things and enjoy all the freedom and safety of that, that yard. But outside um, is danger. And, and so parents, the, I remember we had one family over to our house, and uh, the uh, family there had kids similar age to our kids. And one of their sons was on our front porch, and we had a little porch swing, and we were all swinging, and the other adults were talking to us, and kids are playing. And uh, anyhow, in the front yard, there was no fence, but lots of yard between us and that road, and so kids are playing. Anyhow, uh, this individual son just decided that he was kind of a magnet to that road and just starts taking off running to the road. He might be five years old, six years old, something like that. And we think, okay, he's about to cut over this way, or he's not going to really run straight to the road. And then all of a sudden, the parents think, okay, what is he doing? And the dad starts hollering at the son, uh, saying his name, telling him to stop, all of this. Here's the problem. If you don't raise your children to obey your verbal instruction, you'll find yourself running through somebody else's front yard, chasing your own child. And that's what this dad did. He got his cardio in that afternoon uh, there in Newcastle. That child did not listen, did not obey, clearly could hear the voice of his father. And so anyhow, a little bit of a scene breaks out. And when the father catches up to the son, you know, he is grabbing him and he's saying, what are you doing? It is dangerous out there. You heard me. You know, and he's lecturing him in that moment because he is he's fearful of the danger that's in that road. Listen, the Ten Commandments, the law of God, are, yes, legislation, divinely, if you will, and people balk at the idea of legislation, but if you play inside those parameters, if you live your life inside those parameters, oh, it's a bunch of safety, and you avoid a bunch of headache. I mean, thou shalt not commit adultery, just stay pure. Thou shalt not lie. You know, make sure that you have truth in your communication. You, you apply the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. You'll stay out of jail. You know, I, I'm just saying there is safety inside God's law. So let us not be rebellious towards or reject the do's and don'ts of Scripture, even as Christian people. Don't, don't say you love the Lord and then not really love His Word. Because to love the Lord and to love His Word go hand in hand. Um, people say that they love Shakespeare. Okay, well, quote some of it for me. Well, I don't know, you know, uh, Britain knows some of it. Britain, give me a little snippet of something. Can you? Macbeth, is that Shakespeare? I don't even know. I'm not saying I love Shakespeare. But anyhow, she knows some of that, right? And you can recite some of that. You tell me you love Shakespeare and you can't quote any of it, then you don't love Shakespeare. Don't tell people you love God, but you can't quote any of his word. You, you don't meditate on it. You don't really love it. You say it because you're in the Bible belt. You say it because it's what people expect you to say so that they think you're a nice, moral, decent human being. If you love it, you're going to meditate on it. What this, this little section here in Psalm 119 does, look back at verse number 97. If I were to just summarize it, 97 really through 104, it gives us two emphasis, and that is that the Word of God provides wisdom and it prevents wandering. These are reasons why the psalmist loves the Lord, loves the law of God. Because as we noticed when Brother Kaiser led us in the Scripture reading, maybe you noticed these concepts, they're plain on Scripture plain in the Word of God, that the Word of God provides wisdom and it prevents wandering. Now, with those ideas, look at the text with me. Verse number 98, though through thy commandment, thy commandments um, hast made me, notice this, wiser than mine enemies. So God's Word provides wisdom, making him wiser than his enemies, for they are ever with me. 
Uh, and notice this idea of understanding. I have more understanding. This is wisdom. More understanding than all my teachers. Uh, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Verse number 100, I understand. Uh, the Word of God, again, provides wisdom. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. The ancients is a reference to the aged people. People that have lived a long time but have not loved the Bible. Somebody that has lived a lot less in years can be a whole lot wiser individual, at least on a divine level, because they have loved the Bible and they've applied the Bible to their lives. The Word of God provides wisdom. That's what Paul means when he tells Timothy, let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example, and then he describes moral character and purity. Timothy, you can be young, and you could still pastor the people at Ephesus as long as you saturate yourself with the Word of God. Again, he's saying that the Word of God has provided him wisdom, making him wiser than his enemies, and, and more understanding than even his teachers, and, and more wisdom and understanding than those that have lived much longer than he has. So the Word of God provides wisdom, but then also the Word of God prevents wandering. Verse number 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. He wants to be submissive to the law of God. Verse number 102, I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. So he's refrained his foot from every evil way, and then he has not departed um, and these are the results of, of growing up under the Shema, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Teaching your children diligently to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. It is an investment for sure on the part of parents, but we want as best as we can. And, and not all of it is within our control as parents. But, but what is within our grasp, we want to do our best to make sure our children don't wander into the nonsense of this world. So we constantly say things in front of our children like, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. We, uh, a lot of you have uh, Bible verses around your house and things that you want to keep before your own eyes and you want to keep before the children's eyes. By the way, that is Deuteronomy 6, to do that. Um, because you, you, don't, you want to prevent your own heart from wandering and you want to endeavor to prevent your family from wandering. I have refrained my feet from every evil way. These are reasons why he can say, that the word of God is sweet in verse number 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. We ought to love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. We ought to ask the Lord to give us that kind of a spirit. So the word of God provides wisdom and it prevents wandering. Uh, so this is my Bible. I, I gave the sermon this title, that I love my Bible. It's a personal uh, title. Um, this particular Bible, I've shared some of these details. Maybe I'll give you a few more here right now. But this particular copy of the Word of God was given to me 25 years ago. This exact same one. I was 16 years old and 41 years old now. And uh, the date, it was on my birthday. Uh, the date is written inside here. And uh, so I've had this Bible 25 years. Uh, on almost every page, I have uh, notations, um, and again, a lot of these notations, I was a high schooler, so I have misspelled notations. Um, I shouldn't even say it that way. As an adult, I have misspelled notations, <laughs> and, uh, and so there are aspects of this where if they were to fall into someone else's hands, I might be a little embarrassed of, they, like, he can't even spell that word, you know, or whatever, uh, you know, because it's personal, it's personal. And it's precious. And it is my copy of that which is everlasting, the Word of God. Uh, I'm not against an app on your phone. I have two Bible apps on my phone, as a matter of fact. But, uh, so use those, sure. But make sure you have a copy of the Word of God that you can uh, fill up with notes and, and maybe include prayer requests and, and that you have kind of a, an intimacy with. 
Because you love your Bible. You don't leave it laying. And if you do, in a moment of dereliction, you feel terrible and you rush to find it. Because it's precious to you. Um, my pastor modeled this for me. Mark Monty, uh, growing up in his youth group, um, he has the same Bible he has had since he was a teenager in the Bryn Mawr, Minnesota neighborhood. Same exact, let me say it this way, same exact this, but I'll get that later, but different this. Monty has had his Bible rebound three times at minimum. And by the way, that's rather expensive. But, but all of this and all of his notations are very precious to him, very important to him. And he scrolls back and he looks at things that the Lord taught him when he was a teenager. The Lord taught him, showed him when he was in his 20s or his 30s. And it is precious to him and it is valuable. And so without being overly sentimental, I want us to steward well the abundance of copies of the Word of God that we have. And you ought to have one that is precious to you that the Lord has used to teach you by His Spirit. And uh, you ought to mark it up and you ought to make much of this book because then this book will make much of you. Do you love your Bible? Let's pray together, please.